welcome back to another episode of How Real Estate Changed My Life. And if you've listened to any of the episodes before, the whole gist is I'm trying to just interview people that are out there doing it. And you know, maybe it's their full time job, maybe it's not, but these are real life people that real estate can say that they've that they can say real estate has changed their life in a way that is significant, but it's not scary to chase the same path. So with that said, I got Zach Coppinger here, who is one of these guys, I can honestly say, I already know without even hearing the whole story that real estate's changed your life for the better. And, you, and you've worked it in a way for, like we were just talking before you started recording on, you know, the long game, you're playing the long game. And I think you put a lot of stuff out there that people, I don't want to say they don't want to hear, but they don't want to listen to it because it's, it doesn't validate their, their dreams and aspirations as quick as, the, as, as what they see on the flashy Lamborghini guys. But Zach, if you want to just take a second, tell us about who you are, what your story is, and, and let's just kind of talk about your story from kind of beginning to the end or whatever direction you want to take it. Yeah. So my name is Zach Coppinger. I invest in real estate here in DFW. I do a little bit of everything right now. I wholesale a little bit, flip a little bit, have a rental portfolio that you're so kind to manage. Mm -hmm. uh, Appreciate I, the uh, <laughs> opportunity. There's the plug. I have an owner finance note portfolio, do some hard money lending. And I also uh, invest in the GP and LP capacity in some uh, uh, syndications commercial commercial side with some multifamily assets some self storage and i think that's kind of the umbrella that i'm currently operating under which looks quite a bit different than it did 4 or 5 years ago we try to just continue to push the envelope push the envelope a little bit start uh, investing in new asset classes the hard money lending was kind of born not from an effort but from someone calling and saying hey will you loan me money and i had some excess cash sitting and i said why not and that's turned into we'll probably do about 40 or 45 hard money loans this year so nice little you know uh, arrow tad to the quiver, but got into real estate investing in 2013, working for a home investors franchisee. I started buying houses for him. That's kind of how I got my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. I found something that I was good at. Mm -hmm. I, I was not a stellar college student. I found real estate. I had had I'd been interested in real estate from some, I guess, prior experiences and prior some prior exposure from a neighbor of ours. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But was interested in it. Uh, got my foot in the door. Learned how to comp houses. Learned how to assess rehab budgets. Learned how to locate deals, negotiate them, which were, you know, building blocks to be able to do this on my own, but was able to do that under the tutelage of somebody else. And uh, I really excelled at it. It, uh, I knew I wanted to do it on my own, didn't know when the right time was. And that was kind of forced upon me within about a year and a half of uh, being in the business. So I've been on my own since 2015. It's been a ride. And it's been a lot of fun. So were you uninvited to work there because you're good at what you did and you look like you might be comp competition or know too I much? Think, I think a little bit of that. I uh, I ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to answer them, just tell me no, but I'm going to mm -hmm. keep asking. Yeah. But I wasn't just a leech. I was, I was doing really well in the role. So mm -hmm. I would ask a lot of questions. Uh, I was trying to take in as much information as I could because I knew I wanted to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it came to a point where there just wasn't a growth path forward. And I think that became obvious to who I was working for. Wasn't quite obvious to me yet. I'm not sure I was ready to be put out on my own. That being said, you know, if you're in my position, like I was, where, hey, I'm doing well, I'm learning, I still have a lot more to learn. You never know when the right time is to leave. And mm -hmm. sometimes being told to leave is the best thing for you. You just don't yeah. know that it's the best thing for you whenever. Well, it happens. forces you because if you have a good gig, you won't leave. Uh, with, with Correct. The, the enemy of great is good. And mm -hmm. if people are good and they're comfortable and great. You got to do some things that are uncomfortable to get there. And Growth is at the edge of the comfort zone. Yeah. And I was out of my comfort zone for sure. Yeah. Whenever I just kind of went out on my own, the growth has been very organic. I went out mm -hmm. on my own, was a solopreneur from 2015 till I think 2019 or 2020, uh, have been hiring on since, but kind of crawl, walk, walk faster, walk faster, start jogging, jog faster. I'm not trying to get it over my skis. I know, but and, you got, uh, you got a jet pack behind you. I see what you're doing. I'm watching a little bit from a distance. If I had to graph, if I had to put it on a graph though, you know, 2015, 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, I'm about to get out of frame. And then 21, 22, we've really kind of gone up. It, it was a little bit tough. I had friends of mine that I saw in 2015, 16, and 17 that were doing a lot more than me. And you're, while I had confidence in, in the path, you're kind of looking saying, what am I missing? They're, they're blowing right past me. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you got to remind yourself that comparison's the thief of joy. Be confident mm -hmm. in what you're doing. Enjoy what you're doing. And I do think that building a solid business foundation is one of the hardest things to do. It is mm -hmm. not sexy and it is not fast for, for most people. It is well, not fast. It takes well, time. There's no replacement for it. I and I think you, you hit on a point, especially with your hockey stick you know, graph 
I think that's most real estate investors that have the long game in mind. They 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 forego the early dollars for the long term dollars. So like in my situation, mine was a a very flat one also, and then it took off, and it was as a result of going without early on to invest in the future. You know, and and you can always judge everybody else around you. And I you know I've I was guilty of like, man, there's all these people I graduated with A and M, they're they're doing better than me. Yeah. Their LinkedIn profile has a lot more power to it than mine. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna go backwards for a second. We haven't talked yeah. about this. My first mm-hmm. gig out of college was managing uh, some fast food franchises. Mm-hmm. I thought I might want to get into fast food franchising. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty humbling experience to be working frontline at a at a. It was a yogurt store. Mm-hmm. Uh, the yogurt franchise. Now the goal was to get experience to go for franchise on my own, mm-hmm. uh, but working frontline at a yogurt franchise with a four-year degree from Texas A and M, and having your your uh, former classmates come in and you're serving them yogurt, yeah, uh, making forty thousand dollars a year. That yeah. is humbling. Yeah. Now I learned pretty quickly that I did not want to be relying upon minimum wage labor and a low margin product for mm-hmm. my business model. So. I did that for about a year and a half, two years, and then sought some uh, opportunities in real estate. But yeah, like you said, there's some humbling experiences along the way. And if you don't have the humility to do some of those things, you're robbing yourself of your future potential. That's my opinion. You know, my wife and I will talk sometimes when it's just us. You're like, man, you see all these people around us that have, they just never had the hiccup. Their, their career path out of college just it never stopped. It just kept going straight up. You know, I had those hiccups, those, those kind of like the humbling experiences. I had that, but man, I feel so much better because I had, I wouldn't trade a, I wouldn't trade a minute for it because I, all the valuable experience that I got from that. And I appreciate every moment that I had that was in what you would refer to as a humbling moment, because I think that built that character that, that is needed to do what you've done and what I've, I feel like I've done also to some, to some level. So you're, you're, you've got a whole bucket full of things that you're doing. What passion do you have with real estate and why has it got into real estate? So my neighbor growing up, he was a a landlord. He had about 70 or 80 rental properties. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything other than the guy was always at home drinking coffee on his back porch, drinking beer, fishing. Mm -hmm. That guy's got the life. What is he Mm -hmm. doing? Now, I didn't see him build the portfolio. I saw him own the portfolio Mm -hmm. and season the portfolio and sitting on a, sitting on decades of work. Mm -hmm. But his lifestyle was interesting to me. Whenever I was growing up, I always told my dad, I want to make a lot of money and not work very much. You know, that's one of those kind of naive things. Everybody says that. Yeah. Right. Right. But I saw real estate as a tool, a tool that could combine retirement, kind of active job, active income, investing, um, everything encompassing under one umbrella. And it allowed me flexibility. So if you invest in your 401k, your IRA, there's all these rules about what you can and cannot do with distributions, with with contributions, with what you can invest in. I didn't want to be under anybody's thumb. I didn't want to be told you can only, you can buy houses, but you can only buy three a year. You can only mm-hmm. buy four a year. You, you, you can only invest this much. You can only invest in this asset class. So I, I saw freedom in real estate mm-hmm. from my neighbor. Now, now it was an incomplete understanding of what it, what it was that he did and how he got there. Um, but that was the initial seed. You're an A&M guy. Do you know yeah. Doug Peterson in College Station, Twin City Properties? Yes. I mean, I, I don't, we don't, I don't know him personally, but yes. So he came and spoke in one of my entrepreneurship classes in my senior year. And he owned, I think, 800 houses in Bryan College Station. He was, uh, he had really scaled. He, has, he owns a subdivision. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he. His story is he started buying houses, then streets, then subdivisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, did it at a time where I think it was possible to build that kind of portfolio. I think in a small college town like that today, that's that's really really hard to do. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was another kind of vocal voice in my corner, encouraging me that real estate for the right person, for the right kind of mindset, person with the right skill set could can, can really change your life and and propel you in certain ways. So roundabout way, those were two influences that caused me to be interested uh, in real estate. And the granular thought of, I could own a house, I can have a tenant pay my mortgage, and I'll have it paid off in a certain amount of time, and then I'll still own the asset. That seemed really uh, like a no-brainer investment if you could find a way to make it work. Mm-hmm. So that was the kind of initial uh, nudge to, to try to get involved and see what I could make of it. And, and I would say that's a level one. That That's a very... St- simple version of owning a rental house. Now oh, you've taken yeah. it to the next level. Overly simplistic. Yeah. Yes. So uh, if, if somebody came to you and said, hey, I've got this house, I've had it for 
10 years, I'm working on paying it down so it'll be paid off when I'm retired and this will be it. What would you do with that house instead? I got asked this question this past weekend. Did you really? Good. Yes. What would I do? Or well, what see, would I advise the person to do that's asking? The well, if it was yours, because what happens is we see all these people that come to my company all the time and like, hey, I'm, I'm paying this down. I want to have all the, I want to have these five paid off when I retire. Let them know there are other options. But, you know, mm-hmm. I just think that's a I don't want to say the safe, but it's man, I just see the potential beyond that. So and, what and I encourage people, people to do is to reverse engineer the goal. Mm-hmm. So know where you want to get. And then you can reverse from there. So for some people, it's I can do everything that I want in life if I own five rental properties and they're free and clear. And I don't want a hassle. I don't want headaches. I can manage five myself. I don't have to, you know, that for me, that's five hours a week. I can retire and do what I want. If that is where you find joy and happiness, go for it. Mm -hmm. There is potential to do more with the equity of five houses. But with that comes a lot of extra work, uh, a lot of extra investment in your education and your network. You got to know where you want to, where you want to go in order to, know kind of what path is best for you. And I've long subscribed to, we, we said earlier, comparisons, the thief of joy. Don't mm-hmm. do what makes someone else happy. Make mm-hmm. Do what makes you happy. And if what makes you happy is the five rental properties, there is a decent chance that once you get there, you'll see the bigger picture mm-hmm. um, and you'll want to do a little bit more. I think that's kind of innate mm-hmm. in a lot of people that have the discipline to go buy five and pay them off and own them free and clear and keep them in good in good repair. But uh, don't chase somebody else's dream. Chase your own. So you're a finance guy. I see your Facebook posts constantly. I'm using Facebook book instead of fake book because other people <laughs> listen to this. But the whole thing is like you put out a lot of good content that we, we talked about this just a minute ago before we started recording that really enlightens people what you can, what the potential is and what the long-term goal is. And so re- focusing on maybe return on equity and how to analyze a property and what to really look for, not just a quick flash. So talk about return on equity. I think that's somewhere where you can provide a lot of value that I think a lot of people overlook. Like, do you focus on that? I do. And I want to be very clear. I'm a work in progress. Mm -hmm. I do not have it all figured out. These are iterations of just kind of internal thoughts and conversations Mm -hmm. and trying to pay attention to those that are in a weight class above me Mm -hmm. and just kind of emulate what it is that they're doing and how they're doing it. So I remember I got asked the question, what's your return on equity? And I didn't know the answer. Mm-hmm. I said, I, I've got a lot of it. I mean, I, I bought properties in 2015 that were 322 bricks that I bought for 70 grand in Garland. They're worth 250, 275 today. There's a bunch of equity sitting there. And I'm easily covering my debt service on my loan. I'm mm-hmm. cash flowing. I've got a great thing going. What why would I mess that up? And then you say, okay, but you've got you've got equity that could be invested in something else that you could force appreciation on that is stuck making low single digit returns because while it's cash flowing, it's not it's not this massive money maker, right? It services its debt. It puts a little bit of money in your pocket. So then I'd ask myself, my my initial goal was to get to a hundred rental properties and I'm set in life. I don't need to do anything else. And I got to I think 45 in my mid to late 20s. And I, I was going to blow past the goal and not be working in mm-hmm. a very short amount of time if I had met the goal and stopped working. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to keep working, but I said, man, I've got this equity sitting. Uh, the goal with 100 rental properties was this assumption of freedom, enough freedom to do whatever I wanted whenever I wanted to. But single, low single digit return on equity said that I had equity that I could play with and move it. If you don't keep equity moving, it gets stagnant and then mm-hmm. you start earning those low single digits. And if you see these kind of commercial multifamily investors, their deal cycles are often five to seven years. Mm-hmm. Well, you never pay off the debt. Why would you, you know, the goal is to have free and clear assets as my thinking in my head. Why would I? try to cycle deals in and out after five to seven years, you start to pay attention to the cycle. You've got this forced appreciation window where you buy a distressed asset. Forced appreciation is not market appreciation. It is you bring it up to market value through sweat equity, right? Mm -hmm. Through improved operations, through um, investment in the CapEx, the property, and you you get this artificial bump in value from all of your hard work. Mm -hmm. Then you stabilize it, which continues to increase the value. But once you've reached that five to seven year cycle, if it goes according to plan, you've kind of maximized your IRR, which factors in time, Mm -hmm. right? Cash on cash doesn't factor in time. IRR factors in time. You've reached your peak IRR. And in order to keep that IRR, you need to reinvest that equity into another value add property where you can uh, replicate that same process and keep stacking them over and over, which really allows the equity to grow at a much faster pace than if it just sits in a stabilized asset like a rental property that you bought five years ago. If you bought it five years ago, the only thing that's going to improve the value if you've already done your value add plan is additional market appreciation which in a normal market is what? 
three percent per yeah, year. That doesn't get sad about, yeah. Three percent per year. It's not bad, but if you're wanting to maximize what you can do with that equity, you keep it moving into new projects with forced value add every five to seven years. So I started to sell off some of the seasoned single family portfolio and invest into value add, bigger value add deals via 1031 exchanges. And the 1031 exchange is basically a tax advantage situation where you can sell a property, not have to pay property gain or capital gains and roll that equity into the next deal. And that way it's a, it's a way the government encourages people to buy houses. And, uh, and I don't know, are you doing the, the purchase of real estate? Yes. Right. Now, are you doing cost segregation also on your purchases? That's the other big, mm-hmm. uh, the big, the, the juice in real estate is the ability to do a cost segregation study to kind of advance, to accelerate your depreciation and take it in earlier years. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not increasing the amount of depreciation you can take. You're just accelerating it into the earlier years to offset your income if you're a real estate professional, where oftentimes you can pay very uh, little to no income tax. You can keep that up as long as you keep Mm. growing and building, which is continuing to move up into bigger deals. But if you stop building the portfolio, that eventually runs out and then you end up Mm. paying tax. But yes, it's it's a tax advantage strategy, uh, but you can't touch the money. So, you know, to make these numbers really big, if you bought a property for Two million and sold it for four million, and you've got two million in profit that you want to roll into another deal. You close at the title company. You don't get to touch any of it. It immediately goes to a qualified intermediary, and it feels like you're just moving chess pieces on a board. Is what is, you're doing? Uh, yeah, the numbers don't feel real. It's because mm-hmm. uh, uh, you never you never see it. You never touch well, it. Well, you can go to it's the bank and do a cash out refi, and then you can do that. Yes, but uh, real estate's the only vehicle that I think is is accessible with low barriers to entry for a mom and pop investor to scale and grow um, with some really incredible tax advantages. Mm-hmm. The the IRS for all of its faults, man, they they love real estate. Yeah, it's fascinating. And and that's something they don't teach you in your class at AM. I don't know, maybe you did I didn't do any real estate courses down there and you know I had a great time and I learned a lot, but it was mostly outside the classroom. And uh, you you need to be more involved with AM. They have a really good entrepreneurship program. I think you'd get a lot of value out of. I've I've long thought about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've just never taken the action to really get involved with it much. And I should because I I there were some speak that what I got the most out of were the guest speakers that came to the entrepreneurship classes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd like to be a soundboard for for students. I do think that the both high school and college education should focus a lot more on the real world application of how to make yourself financially free and how to manage finances. And it's it's just not talked about. Well, the system's set up to encourage employment. And I, I understand that. But I think you, you've got one. How many children do you have? One, two? Two now. Yeah, two two now? I've, got okay. a, I've got a four week old. So I think it, that education on how to become you know, good steward financially and and not de- be dependent upon somebody else. I think that education is going to come from you and it's going to come from me and our, you know, our spouses. And that's where we have to ed- educate our children in that regard, because the school district set up for teaching somebody to go get a job, be able to add, subtract, work at the yogurt store. I don't know if you're familiar with the Investing in Tomorrow, my nonprofit that we set up this, this last mm-hmm. year. And what we do is we we help support students that are investing in themselves so that they can have a better shot of financially supporting themselves when they graduate high school, whether it's HVAC training, uh, welding, cosmetology, n- nursing. There's a bunch of programs that Keller ISD does. And, and all these high schools are now doing these to where students can graduate with a trade or not even a trade. Maybe it, it, it's something to help them make them more competitive when they do go to college. But uh, we, we've got students now that can go out and make a, a, lo- a livelihood yeah. instead of doing the, oh, you have to go to college. So I do think they're doing a little bit. They don't teach them the finances side, but at least they're doing a little bit better on the trade program. I think trades are the next, are, are the future wave, I think, of, of high school students that mm-hmm. can not incur six mm-hmm. figures of debt and come yeah. out and, and quickly make six figures of income mm-hmm. uh, if they apply themselves. But uh, yeah, I, I think I was lucky. My father's a CPA. I grew up with uh, financial literacy in the home, but I don't want to minimize my efforts. He's all, my dad's always there to answer questions. But it's not like he pinned me down and say, you will do this, right? There was information available, but you got to apply the information. You've got to seek out more information and kind of connect all the dots and make it make sense in your life. I've seen a lot of investors come come through my doors and, and the ones that use their CPA or are CPAs, they do way better. But the CPAs that make those decisions to jump into owning real estate, are there's not as many of them as you would think from my experience. Because they're really good about processing what comes across their desk, not thinking about what comes across their desk. And I always find that fascinating because I've my my accountant, I bring 
solutions to him sometimes that he's like, oh yeah, I didn't realize you could do that for non-commercial. Like it was just some of these, sometimes you have to do your own research and bring that to a CPA and a good CPA is going to help you. Like, do I buy this, finance this? Do I lease it? Like as far as equipment goes. And so it's, it's good to have a CPA that, that does that. You're very fortunate to have a father that was helping you along those lines because I am very fortunate yeah. for that. Yes. So what advice would you give to, to somebody that's kind of on the outside looking in? Maybe they're listening to this on a podcast, driving to work. This is, this is very broad, not very real estate related, but uh, it's, it's to take action. You know, analysis paralysis, a lot of people just sit around and say, I knew I should have done that. Convince yourself now to do it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't be the, I should have done that. Do it now, whatever it is. If it's real estate, fantastic. If it's another business you're wanting to start, fantastic. If it's you're stagnant in a current job role and you need to get uncomfortable, and go find a new opportunity where you can grow, do it. Take action. The, what separates the haves from the have-nots are those that took action. It's not luck. Uh, the people that take action are the luckiest. That's always how it looks. Man, I have to agree with that. And, and I think in the last two years, I've spent a lot, and that's why this podcast is here, I've spent a lot more time focusing on like the long-term vision and where do I want to go and networking with people that are like-minded or two steps ahead of me so I can follow their footsteps or kind of look at their roadmap and see where it might fit in my picture. And one of the big things I did take away is like, why am I not doing something? And it, and sometimes you have like these mental blocks that think, oh, well, I'm not there. I can't do this. But I think my thing was, I didn't think like, I didn't sit back and say, well, why don't I do this? And that's why I've got the nonprofit or that's why I've, I'm doing some other projects that I probably shouldn't bring up yet on the internet. But like, I've got these projects that are in the pipe that would have never been a something that would ever come across my mind because I would never thought I'd been to that level. But I'm like, you know what? The guy that's, that's at that level, like he was in my spot one day and then he just chose to take action. And there's a lot of people that just, it's not always as scary as people think it is. I mean, real estate's really being, conservative. It's amazingly conservative. Being where I am now, I remember whenever I had just started seeing people with uh, about my level of success and thinking that there was this huge gap between me and them. Mm -hmm. This gap that was like, how do I ever bridge that? How do I get there? And being in my position now, I say, the gap's not as big as you think. Now, but you can't replace the time in between. You've Mm -hmm. got got to put in the time. But the skills gap, it's organic if you just, if you study every day. And if you find something you enjoy, it's not studying, it's just having fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, But the gap closes very quickly and the amount of knowledge that you can take in and apply. What's separating you from your goals is not as much as you think, mm-hmm. but it's the work that you've been avoiding. That's, that's simply that. Yeah, you, you got some good nuggets in there. I like, I like the value you're given. You talked a lot about the residential, primarily single family homes, and you, you mentioned briefly about some commercial stuff you're, you've stepped into, and that'd be a growth piece, I guess, in your plan. So how did you decide to do the storage unit or, or the other commercial projects? Like, so the genesis of that was the thought of, I need to keep equity moving. So mm-hmm. how do I keep equity moving? I love real estate. I do not love single family rental properties. They are a, a foot in the door. They were a tool that allowed me to build a chunk of equity. And I wanted to test what I could do with that equity and other asset classes. Mm-hmm. So I've also spent quite a bit of time networking, finding operators that, that I trust. And I didn't wait to network and find operators until I needed to find operators. I had just been kind of naturally networking for years. So they would have projects coming up, um, some local apartment investors. Some of them are syndicators. Some of them are not syndicators. Mm-hmm. I know one guy that I've invested with, he just buys by himself. And I said, hey, would you ever take other investor equity? Well, I don't really need it. What he said, I said, I know. That's why I want to invest it with you. If you don't <laughs> need it, you've got a track record of turning deals and making money. And he said, yeah, uh, we can do some deals together. So I've been in two deals with him over the past 12 months. You know, I sold off maybe a tranche of five or so rental properties for each investment. And you know, the investment amounts, I'm not going to minimize the amount. They're not huge. They're not small. They're about 800000 to a million bucks. One was four fifty. One was eight fifty. Another one coming out might be about a million bucks. Mm-hmm. But it's just the, the kind of dip your toe in the water. Don't do everything all at once. I didn't, I didn't sell the entire portfolio to one buyer and dump mm-hmm. it all in one deal. We're kind of piecing it off in tranches of five properties mm-hmm. and putting it in different assets with different operators and seeing what the returns are. But I didn't want to make the jump and become a syndicator myself. Mm-hmm. I'm still operating my, my single family business. The goal is to leverage my efforts in single family and see if the potential return of the syndication far exceeds just the market appreciation of staying in those assets. Mm-hmm. And then once you get to a certain equity point that you're playing with, you know, if you can get to, I don't know, $25 million, a lot of other opportunities start to open up. So it's just all about reaching these different thresholds. And you want to, you know, for me, I don't want to just sit back and be be lazy and say, hey, I'll just, you know, kind of laissez-faire what, what comes comes, but also realizing that time is your friend 
be willing to wait the time necessary for the investment to do what it needs to do and right. don't get so caught up in getting there faster than you need to. Because if you do, it's a good way to uh, end up in bankruptcy if you right. try to just kind of artificially go past what the market's going to allow you to do. Uh, and that's not a way to say, be passive, don't push. Mm-hmm. It's just saying, unless you're, you're Facebook, unless you're Instagram, I mean, you know, they're, they're the exception, not the norm. It takes a while to build a portfolio and stabilize it. And uh, I started in my, my mid twenties and I'm in my mid thirties now. I'm doing I'm doing okay. I'm doing pretty well. There's still a lot of room ahead of me, but I also know that I'm not going to be. I need to be patient to get where I want to be. Put it that way. Right now, when you put money in with the other gentleman that didn't need your money, did you go in as a GP or a limited partner with very limited upside or a little bit of both? So we did okay. one deal where uh, I was just an LP, straight LP equity. Now, the syndicate structure was pretty advantageous. There was no acquisition fee. The pref was reasonable. The deal was solid. Broker relationships are a big deal. If you find an operator that's got really good broker relationships, they're getting deal shopped to them before they hit market. Mm -hmm. Um, It is different than single family. You're not sending a letter to a distressed apartment owner that's going to take 50 cents on the dollar. But there are deals out there to be had. And if you've got, if, if someone's got really good broker relationships and has a proven track record, that's just such a valuable asset that is very hard. You can't replace it without time because you have to have proven yourself to be able to do the deal and close. So those are those are relationships that are decades in the making. And being able to stand on those shoulders and be a part of the deal is something that's very yeah, it, The apartment complex is a different animal. And, you know, I me, mean, I've been I've cut my teeth and distressed single families and I'm that's my bread and butter and you know we're where we're at like that's that's what we do and we're really good at it. So I, I keep telling myself, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to go to apartments. I'm supposed to do apartments next. But I just couldn't get passionate about it and I'm like if I throw money in something I don't want to be a limited cuz I'm so used to being the the lead on everything. So that was kind of one of the things that was really hard for me to overcome. So we're we're going to do something on single family in bulk is kind of what we're going to do cuz that's that's my my understanding, my background. Yeah, I I understand that. There was a bit of a detachment necessary to to trust someone else with the operational, I guess power and the operational. I mean, if you're an LP, right? You're not the one making decisions. The GP is the mm-hmm. one making decisions. So, they've got to have a proven track record, you track record. You've got to be comfortable with them. But also, I wanted The thought was I can keep actively managing the single family assets, make market appreciation. I can go actively reinvest those and, you know, stabilizing more single family, which is not the easiest thing to do in with that amount of equity to play with. You'd be Mm -hmm. buying a lot of houses, trying to stabilize a whole lot to meet your 1031 timeframes. Or I'm not going to make as much as an LP as I did building a single family portfolio by myself. I know that. But a lot of the people that have built these big portfolios, you can go from, you know, at a below a certain threshold, 100% return to another threshold, 50% return. Once you get to a bigger, these bigger thresholds, you're not going to keep making these massive returns that you do like you do in single family. You've got to temper that with what the market can actually do with those asset classes, but you have assets that you can actually invest that large chunk of equity into. If you've got $10 million of equity. How do you, what do you do with single family? Yeah. And if it's a 1031, it's not as simple as just going and paying cash for all for a whole single family portfolio because you've got to replace all the value that you sold. And if you've got debt on those properties, debt has to be a component of what you're going to replace. So you'd have to buy a package of 100, 150 properties. Mm-hmm. You got to have a big old team in place to be able to do yeah. that. Doing what I'm doing with these uh, LP positions and some GP positions, I don't have to have a huge team to do that. And I don't love managing a big team. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I like to stay lean. So right now, this is working well. We'll see how this uh, how this grows uh, from here over the next five, 10 years, but it's working well for us. So I've got so many topics in my head. One of them real quick, you barely touched it, but talking about your team, you put out a lot of wholesale, re- you, you do a lot of the residential single family home business side right now. Do you do this all by yourself or do you have a team that kind of work supports you? Yeah, I've got a team. I've got a full-time transaction coordinator, office admin. I've got a full-time acquisitions guy, full-time dispo guy, full-time back office. That's my dad. Um, And then we've got uh, a number of 1099s that do, uh, you know, subcontractors that do the renovations for us. Good, good. So Yeah, because I was like, man, you get way too many emails to me want me to buy your houses for, for to be you doing something, all that. I like to provide content this year. Mm-hmm. We'll do um, like real content this year. We'll probably buy 70. I think we're on track to do right over 70 houses, hard money loans, about 40 owner finance originations are down. We'll only do maybe 10. Uh, we were doing 20, 25 a year. And then yes, yeah, syndicate opportunities, investments in, in uh, LP and GP positions will probably be at four or five this year. So I've not had anybody that did owner finance that I can think of so far on the, my podcasts. 
Can you explain some of the benefits of selling owner finance? And I know there's several different ways to do that if you've got underlying or if you've got cash or however, but tell us the pros and cons of that. Yeah. So there are seasons in businesses and I went through a season of building a rental portfolio and I realized it was not cash flowing very much. Mm-hmm. You try to forecast that on paper and you say, look, I can make 450 a month cash flow in this rental. If I get 40 of those, mm-hmm. that'll equal this amount of money per month. I can just retire, you know, sixteen thousand a month. I can retire, whatever the whatever the amount is. It didn't turn out to be that way. Uh, the the equity was growing at a fast pace. Uh, the balance sheet looked great. The income statement just wasn't producing much money off the rental portfolio. There were a couple of deals along the way building the rental portfolio up to about I think forty or forty five houses that I had sold under finance because they just didn't make sense as a rental. I the the rehab I would have had to have put into them. This these were in Mesquite. You know Mesquite. The yeah. city's going to make it a pill for you to be able to get those houses rentable. They they know me uh, at the courthouse down there and it's what they're doing is illegal but it, my it's attorneys are, my attorneys are like yeah we can fight this and i'm like no i don't want to fight i just want to because i still got to do business in that town like let's yeah. just let's just play their game it is it is a game and the game for me became if i've got to put 50 into it to get it to to be in rent ready condition where the city will actually give me a co or i could literally sell this thing as it sits today and i can cash flow i don't know four or five hundred bucks a month you know between my underlying and what i'm selling mm-hmm. it for and uh, my underlying is 15 year and I'm selling it on a 30. The numbers look pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. And it just didn't make sense as a rental. So it was wholesale it, flip it or owner finance it. So I would owner finance a few. And then analyzing the cash flow from the owner finance notes, it was really consistent. We talk mm-hmm. about mailbox money in real estate. Rental properties were not mailbox money. That took, that took work. There's work. Yeah. Uh, the owner finance notes were as close to mailbox money as I had. You spend a lot of time getting the property sold. And then once it's sold and stabilized, you're a bank. They're just mm-hmm. making monthly payments. And now sometimes people are late on payments. A few times people don't make their payments. So there's still inputs that you've got to be making every week, but it took very little of my time. So I switched gears or just kind of went down another fork and started building up the note portfolio and not really putting much thought into building the rental portfolio anymore. And then uh, I ran out of depreciation and I was paying some massive tax bills. So then uh, this was maybe in 2021, whenever I thought I need to get a balanced portfolio of interest income, you know, rental income, depreciation. I think a good balanced real estate portfolio has income coming from multiple streams. Uh, and that's kind of where we sit today. Man, you're uh, lucky to have no- a dad for a CPA. Yeah. No, I... <laughs> Fully agree with that. That that is uh, true. Words have never been spoken. But uh, know where your numbers are coming from. I think uh, I talked to a lot of entrepreneurs. Well, the bank account has more money in it now than it did whenever I started. It's not a bad thing, but you have no idea where you're making your money. If you're spending eighty percent of your time on twenty percent of your income, and yeah, spend twenty percent of your time on eighty percent of your income. Mm-hmm. You know, know know where the time is. Know where it's best invested because time is the only resource you can't extend more of. Yeah, man, that's good advice. I'm enjoying every minute. So. And I don't want to take too much of your time. So what what other pieces of nuggets of information do you think somebody should know about real estate that's not doing it right now? The power of real estate is in holding and owning the property. Mm-hmm. People see wholesaling. Wholesaling for me was a means of building capital to go own and hold property. Mm-hmm. It was not a way for me to make a quick buck and feed, uh, you know, for that to be my job. Mm-hmm. Uh, wholesaling was a tool to own property. I tell people, I've, I've made a few Facebook posts about this. Mm-hmm. Anytime that you wholesale a property, so you sell it below market value, you are selling your upside to somebody else. Now, sometimes it's a necessary evil because you've got to fund your operations. You've got to be able to pay for your marketing budget, to pay for your, your office, to pay for your staff, to uh, put some food on the table for your family. But every deal, the best decision that I've made in real estate was early on looking at the deal and saying, how do I keep this? Not, ooh, there's a $40,000 assignment fee. That's sexy. I can do that. I can go buy this new car. I can go buy this house uh, for a personal residence. It was, how do I turn that into momentum for myself in the future? Um, That meant that I had to live well below my, my potential means because I was taking potential earned income and moving it to the balance sheet. So it was unrealized equity sitting over here that I had, I could tap if I needed to, but it was put into the market working 24-7. Your money can work harder for you than you can ever work for your money because it never stops working. Mm -hmm. It never stops moving. My advice to anyone getting into real estate is find a way to buy and own property. If you're a real estate agent, leverage your commissions into owning property. If you're a wholesaler, skim all the good deals off the top and don't wholesale them. Come to Zach for a loan. 
I'll loan you money. Yeah. Uh, but every time that you sell a property, you're selling your upside. And, and that some people really disagree with that. Uh, I don't know if they disagree with it. They push back on it, but it's the absolute truth. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is necessary sometimes to fund operations, but don't mistake it. Anytime that you're selling a deal, you know, if you're selling something below market value, you're giving some, you're selling your upside for a fee mm-hmm. and just know what the cost is because there is a cost to it. Zach, I appreciate all, all that you shared with us. And I hope, and I know somebody's listening to this while they're sitting on their cycle, bicycle, or whatever on their podcast listening devices that, that they're taking this value and, and sitting back and like, well, now I need to take action. I need to go ahead and do it. I think they're going to get a lot of value out of listening to you and, and your wisdom. And I need to get you plugged into A&M more. There's, there's some neat stuff they got going on down there. And I think you'd be able to add a lot of value there. But uh, thank you so much. And I uh, look forward to uh, seeing more of your success and more of your Facebook posts out there. Hey, thanks a lot, Kyle. I appreciate it. Thank you, Zach. Have a good one. Hey, you as well. 